Hi guys, it has gotten to be a very pleasant day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on Monday, March 23rd, 2020, and this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but as you guys probably know, for the past week, we have been doing a special series here called the Coronavirus Chronicles and it is time to wrap up this series, and I cannot think, guys, of a better person to be bringing on to close out this series than none other than Derek Jensen. And guys, Derek Jensen needs no introduction on Collapse Chronicles. So Derek, come on and say hi, and we're going to dive right into this rousing 20, 25-minute conversation. Hi, and thank you for having me on. And um, I'm honored to be the to be the the closing interview here. Okay, you are the you are the the act, the star act. So, uh, Derek. Oh, I, oh, you had Paul Ehrlich, and you had some others that are just fantastic. I I started off with Paul. Uh, he was one. Uh, uh, your book ended. Paul Ehrlich started, and Derek Jensen closes, and with a list of company like that. It's been a wild ride. So uh, anyway, Derek Jensen, obviously the question, uh, I'm going to kind of throw my outline a little bit out the window here in this conversation. Obviously the question people want to hear me ask you, okay, brother, for what, 20 years or more, in 20 books or more, you have been arguing uh, that it is time to bring down global industrial civilization. So Derek Jensen is the coronavirus, the trigger that we have all been waiting for, for the collapse of global industrial civilization, and why or why not? You know, I I am, <laughs> this, this answer is going to be a big, a, a, a big pile of damp squib, because I, I can't say yes. I can't say no. I, all I can say is what my dear friend John Osborne always says, which is the crystal ball is always cloudy. And I think what I can say is that this is a very serious situation, and it is um, – just last night, I was talking to a, a dear friend, that John Osborne. He's a doctor, and he's an environmentalist. And he spent the '80s working on the AIDS, the, the HIV/AIDS issue. And so I was asking him, "When did you when did you first start your ears prick up about this?" And and he said, "Well, you know, I've been through this before because he first twigged on on HIV/AIDS being something huge in about '81." He said, he told me last night, and similarly, I mean, just for, since he's a doctor, just for fun, he reads, like, mortality statistics, and he was reading, you know, when he, he first got concerned about this back in early January when, <coughs> by the way, don't worry about the cough, it's something else. <laughs> but he started worrying about this in early January when Wuhan started locking down, and that's. I started worrying about it a little bit later when I started reading about about Wuhan locking down, and the thing that has let me. It, the, I've I've had a lot of um, cognitive dissonance, and I would be interested to know if you and the other guests did too. I had cognitive dissonance for quite a while because the response early on by mainstream media was seemed to be that this wasn't a huge deal. But then you have a city of however many million people locking down. And then the thing that really got my attention was that uh, at one point they locked down Wuhan. And then two days later, a uh, factory, a Hyundai factory in South Korea shut down. And the reason it shut down is because they have... Um, uh, has any have you any of your guests talked about the uh, just in time method of inventory? Oh yeah, uh, 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 of course. This has been one of the themes uh, okay. mentioned about its effects on that. So I'll just skip over that then, and just that it. The thing that was that was 
confusing me very much and still confuses me a little bit is that they are voluntarily shutting down big parts of the economy. <clears throat> and since when have those in power uh, ever shut down the economy for anything, including, I mean, for, for since when have they valued the lives of human beings over, over, uh, over the economic system. This, this never happens, and certainly not lives of non-humans, which they still don't care about. But I, I have in my in my adult life, or in my life really, I can't remember a time when the fact that people would die uh, would interfere, would be allowed to interfere with the economic system. And a great example, I lived in North Idaho for a couple of years, and there was a very famous... Well, it's only famous locally. That's part of the problem. Is that at one point, for one of the smelters in a town I believe called Smelterville, um, the bag house burned, which is a pollution control device. And so the the CEOs faced a choice: either <clears throat> either A, they can shut down the mine for a little while and shut down the smelter and fix the bag house, or they can continue to run the smelter and mine and um, Send lead into the air, and they chose, of course, the latter. And there's a, there's a, uh, a once again regionally famous um, handwritten notes from the CEO board meeting, where one of the one of the officers writes, um, you know, essentially liability five hundred thousand dollars per kid. So they figured they'll have to just pay five hundred thousand dollars for every kid they poisoned with lead, and it's it's an economic decision, and. Um, and consequently, the children in that community ended up with some of the highest blood lead levels ever recorded in human beings. And that's been my experience, and that's been, you know, in all my work, that's been how uh, how the uh, the economic system has functioned, that it is more important. The system, I mean, it's, it's like Lewis Mumford talked about, what the system is in charge, and the system is more important than... It's like Frederick Winslow Taylor said, you know, in the past, the man was first. In the future, the system shall be first. And so I've had this tremendous cognitive dissonance that either A, things are much worse than they're suggesting, or B, uh, they suddenly are being serving life instead of – and there, there's, I've talked to two different people the last two days about this that have helped me resolve a little bit of my cognitive dissonance. So wait, before we go any further, is my is is what I'm having the cognitive dissonance about clear? Am I explaining that okay? I I, I think you are. So so how are you settling this? I, I mean it 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 it's, it's pretty weird. I, I mean I I am kind of thinking the same thing, trying to second guess what is really going on here, Derek Jensen. Nobody knows. So we're just seeing if, if you said your crystal ball is kind of cloudy. What is going on on this planet right now, brother? Well, there's a, a bunch of levels, and I'm sure that people more qualified than I have talked about these. But, but so on a physical level, the thing that's quite surprising to me is that some sort of pandemic has not already come through, and of course they have, um, but it's not um, reached greater uh, reached greater parts of the population. You know, one of the first written, actually the first thing I ever had published in a major magazine was uh, New York Times Magazine, 1995 or 1996. And it was about how, um, at the time, there was a pandemic in bees, honeybees. And it was either varroa or tracheomites, I don't remember which. And I wrote about how uh, the conditions in agriculture made it so this sort of crisis was completely inevitable. And the conditions were that you'll bring in like a half a million or a million or a million and a half or whatever hives into just Modesto County every winter for almonds, or as they say locally, almonds. And then from there, they'll, you know, you move your bees around to follow the crops, and a lot of those bees will summer in North Dakota. Other beekeepers in North Dakota, they spend the winter down in Florida uh, on the oranges. And so the point is that 
when you bring all these bees together, it creates perfect conditions for the transfer of varomites or any other pathogen. And then you have this tremendous transportation ability and you end up in, so bees can go from, from if you get one set of varomites in Montana and then they go down to the almonds and then other bees from North Dakota are in the almonds, they go back to North Dakota other bees are in North Dakota, and they go down to Florida. You've covered the entire country in a year yeah. with, with Barone. And so when you have this, you couldn't design a better system. If you, were, if you were designing a system from the perspective of pathogens who want to eat humans, you could not design a better factory farm system than a city with massive transportation in between. So this sort of thing has just been, and it's going to happen. Well, and we've known this from history. That in um, until modern hygiene, uh, cities were commonly known as as uh, population sinks. And in London, uh, the life expectancy of anybody who moved from the country to the city, the poor people, um, was about eighteen months. And so this this concentration of people, we didn't evolve this way. And it's amazing that it happened for more often. So first off, one of the things that's happening is something that's been inevitable and on the, on the physical level. And then, so far as the response, I mean, I, okay, so there's that. And, and now, you know, I, I, so far as the response by those in power, there's, there's a couple things that, that two, two different people have helped me understand why those in power have responded as, slightly quickly as they have um, or as as dramatically as they have um, one is that uh, I've got a friend who's 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 Italian and has lots of extended family in Italy he's very concerned about them and he's also a sociologist and he also recognizes that those in power don't for the most part care about about life I mean that you know capitalism just is going to going to consume everybody um but he says that those in power here's his take on it he says those in power are they made an economic decision either a we can shut everything down now and take a big economic hit or if we don't um this this virus will cause a much larger hit to the economic system later and that makes some sense to me in terms because again i can't I have a really hard time perceiving the captains of industry as caring about humans. I just, I just do. <laughs> you and, and me both, brother. Yeah. And so I've been trying to figure out what is their rationale for shutting everything down. And one rationale is that they recognize this is so, so big, so cataclysmic, to use a value-neutral term, that if they don't shut this down now, it'll be a much bigger hammer later. That's one. And then the other, when I was talking to my friend John Osborne last night, he said, look, one of the big differences here between the baghouse smelter and this is that the baghouse smelter was not polluting. None of those people lived in Smelterville, so they weren't going to get polluted. They weren't going to get harmed. And on the other hand, the primary demographic for the victims of this or the, the prey, I should say, of this particular virus are <clears throat> are." 60 men, 60 year old men, 60 years and older, um, which pretty much describes the Senate and the House and the CEOs. So they, his his argument is that they are responding with the alacrity that they have, and some people would say they have not responded with enough alacrity. Anyway, they've responded with the alacrity they have because they themselves could be targeted by this. Ah. And I don't know. So on the larger, I mean, so so there's there's my cognitive dissonance is I, I've not been able to understand. I, I'll just say this again that in my lifetime and in my experience doing all my research, I have and for God's sake they had like the slave trade would kill just millions and millions of people and you know bringing them over on the Middle Passage and they didn't care they were just making money and that's this I, I just have not seen. So I, I, I've been—I've not seen where life 
has been allowed to impede the economic system. I've not seen it. And so that's where my cognitive dissonance came from. And I'm just rambling, so, so ask me so, the question. So is it or is it not going, going to lead to the collapse of global industrial civilization? And, and if it is, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, if it is, or to the degree that it is, is certainly anything from, from my perspective and from, I, well, let's, let's drop my perspective, from, from the perspective of, so what gross domestic product is, is the conversion of living beings into dead products. It's the conversion of living forests into two by fours. It's the conversion of living rivers into kilowatt hours. It's the conversion of everything into units that can be sold and or units that can be killed and then sold. And, you know, a crab on the bottom of the ocean is worth nothing. A crab caught in a trap and then sent off to a to a canning company is worth a, a you know, a buck fifty. And a tree is worth nothing on the stump and is worth, you know, however much per board yeah. foot. And so anything that impedes the economic system, anything that decreases GNP is good for the planet. Okay, and, that's, yeah, this is what I really want you to spend the rest, th this whole series of interviews, uh, Derek, what I've been doing is in, uh, let's call it 25 minutes, well, I've spent 22 minutes talking about humans, 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 and the last three minutes, my very last question to wrap it up is, okay, if, if we were not two humans having this conversation, but we were two bonobos, uh, you, you know, hanging out, looking at this from their perspective. How would uh, this conversation we're having be different? And let's just pretend like we're you and I, uh, which is not too far for me. I don't know about you, brother, uh, being two bonobos. But you know what I'm saying. Any any one of our fellow Earthlings, except humans, humans, humans. Uh, wh what is their spin on the coronavirus? Is this a good thing from their perspective? Um, so you work a little bit. <clears throat> Am I coming through clearly? I can't. I can't hear you. Are we still together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was asking you. Yeah, from the perspective of any of our fellow Earthlings, uh, take their perspective for the next few, for the next seven or eight minutes, and give us your. Is this from any perspective other than the human centric one? A, a story to be celebrating on the planet today? I think that if... I think that anything that reduces ocean traffic, um, anything that in, reduces commercial fishing is good for the fish in the oceans. Anything that reduces uh, logging is good for the forests. Anything that reduces... Um, I mean, for crying out loud, you know, in, in the first just first few weeks of this, carbon emissions went down in China by 25 percent. And we've seen the uh, reduction in pollution. Um, and, you know, for years I've been arguing that a lot of environmentalism is basically like uh, you're being in an emergency room and you're putting putting uh, bandages all over this person is bleeding out and you're, you're putting in infusions, you're doing everything you can, except somebody is still standing there stabbing away. And that somebody who's still stabbing away at the, at the person who's dying is industrial civilization. And however we can reduce the, uh, reduce globalization, reduce the effects of industrial civilization are, those are positive for the planet. And, by when I say however we can, I'm meaning however we we the we the planet. Um, I think that uh, there are some humans <clears throat> who actually make the world a better place. By which I mean the world. I don't mean industrial. When we talk about the world, usually we mean society. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying the real world. Yeah. There are some humans who make the world a better place for for non-humans, but for the most part, we don't. And we should. And that was our rightful role 
was to be one of the many beings. All beings make the world a better place by their existence. Salmon make a better, a forest a better place by their existence. And so again, from from the perspective of the non-humans, anything that impedes industrial civilization is good. Um, and so far as whether they, um, so far as the and, and, and I'm at this point more interested in talking about what this, the effects of this on industrial civilization on in, than on individual humans. I know that there are some people who get really mad at me for talking about how this helps non-humans because they say, what about all the suffering humans? Well, first off, there are, this has not had an effect on population at this point. I mean, this, this is, yes, it's terrible that there are, what, as of yesterday, 14,000 deaths from this or something. That's that's really sad and 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 I mean I I am in one of those risk groups I, I'm immunocompromised etc 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 but that doesn't alter the fact that you know life is that we're all going to die at some point and but that's not the real point the real point is that by shutting down industrial civilization that has had helpful effects for the planet already and the longer that continues the longer the better that is for the planet and humans have existed without industrial civilization for most of our existence and you know in fact i asked both anurata mithal and uh vandana shiva if the people of rural india would be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow they're like oh of course absolutely um, because there are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulip to Europe, dog food and tulips to Europe. So removing the industrial economy from that, removing uh, removing the global economy from that, they're not going to be worse off. And so back to non-humans, yeah, from the per- humans are behaving poorly right now, and we've been behaving poorly for seven or eight thousand years. And if I were <laughs> If I were one of those, if I were a a coho salmon, I would be saying, you know, w- look what you have done to us. And if I were a bison, I would be, look what you have done to us. You've reduced us from 60 million down to 1,000. And so don't talk to me about this. Yeah. So is uh, I guess I guess to wrap up here uh, to wrap up this conversation and this series, Derek Jensen it is humanity. Now, several people, a recurring theme over these is whether or not humanity is going to learn a lesson from this. Is there any chance? Do you have any optimism that a critical mass of humans? are going to take a, a look at this snapshot of, uh, of what is happening and learn any lessons from it that is going to change the way we comport ourselves in relation to this planet or when this thing blows over, however it blows over, it's right back to business as usual. Um. I hate to say this, but I think it's going to be back to business as usual. What do you think? That's exactly what I think. I I, I will be, be be absolutely shocked uh, if uh, if any sort of critical mass. I mean, we're going to be we might be forced forced kicking and screaming to uh, to back off a little bit in our rapacious demands, but beyond that, brother. Uh, I, I don't see uh, these people, uh, Mad Max uh, toilet paper hoarders in, uh, in in Walmart and all of these folks wrapping around gun shops uh, learning any lessons that is going to change humanity's behavior towards this planet. And uh, I was uh, I was wondering if you if you had seen any uh, evidence of it. No, I don't. I don't think so. Well, you know, it's interesting. During during immediate crises, you know, often people in small communities will come together, and that's a that, that's a good thing. But it it often, um, but a I, I I don't think that the individuals who are hoarding toilet paper are 
they're not going to be the driver. Yes, I completely see your point on that. I completely agree with it. And that's sort of a Lord of the Flies situation. <laughs> I, I don't think – I think that the reason – one of the reasons that this will go back to how it was before is because those in power are so fully be, – because the faith, the faith, the faith in capitalism, I don't think has been broken, and the faith in industrialism has not been broken, and in fact, this is going to make, I believe, our our hatred of nature even stronger. Yeah. I mean, there are those who have argued that uh, the origins of civilization, some of the origins of 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 the this culture's hatred of nature, might have come from extended droughts and a time when nature was not treating us. You know, it's like like so many indigenous people have this view of this this bounteous world where you are being fed by this wonderful being called your wonderful collection of beings called nature and how did we come to see ourselves in opposition to that and there's a couple of theorists who've argued that part of the cha- transformation might have been some really dramatic cataclysms that caused people to go gosh you know it 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 really isn't taking care of us, and there are those who argue that the plagues were um, instrumental in sort of amping it up through the Enlightenment, and so I don't see them changing their fundamental hatred of nature coming out of this. I don't see the captains of industry fundamentally changing. Um, it would be nice. One thing I do that, that may emerge from this, I think the best we can hope for is that um, a bit more uh, bioregionalism appears out of this because in a little bit less uh, devotion to the re- religion of globalization, that's the best I think we can hope for. Okay, and I think if, if even we can get that, we're doing good. But anyway, brother, Derek Jensen, we have to... We're coming into 30 minutes, and I know that you are completely slammed, as I am. And as always, brother, we really appreciate you coming on the show and spending some of your valuable time with us. And guys, if you enjoyed what Derek had to share with us, please thumb up this video and subscribe while you're over here. But Derek Jensen, once again, uh, we really appreciate this. And most importantly, keep up the good fight well you too and also thank you so much for i think you've done an incredibly valuable service with collecting all of these perspectives on this and that's that's going to be useful both now and in the future okay we're doing what we can but we're wrapping it up and i'll just have to think of something else to talk about tomorrow anyway uh bye guys